Hi, my name is Laura Ribeiro. Um, I am a researcher at uh, IPMA, is the Portuguese Institute for the Ocean and Atmosphere, and I work at the Aquaculture Research sta Station of uh, this institution. Um, together with Maria Galin from Setaqua, we prepare this model on fish uh, for you. During this model, we will discuss aspects related with, with the following topics fish diversity, abiotic and biotic factors, fish biology and physiology, fish nutrition, feeding and feed management, fish energy budget, fish welfare and health management, and fish production systems. Fish represent an immense and diverse group of aquatic organisms with different body shapes and functions adapted to live in water. Fish are divided in three major groups based on taxonomic classification. Agnatha, chondrictis, which are the cartilaginous fish, sharks, for instance, as example, osteictis fish, also known as bony fish, where the teleost fish are included. In this course, we will mainly focus on the aspects related with teleost biology and especially of species with commercial importance for the Atlantic area. Fish distribution and habitats are strongly affected by abiotic and biotic factors. Among abiotic factors, we have the, the parameters listed here, where you have temperature, dissolved oxygen, salinity, turbidity, light. And among biotic uh, factors, we have to consider food, predators, territorial dominance, among others. In rearing conditions, we are able to control the abiotic and biotic uh, factors in order to provide the best conditions to the species that is being reared. Therefore, we try to understand and identify which are the best values of temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, light, in order to promote uh, the conditions that will provide the best growth results of the species uh, that are being reared. The same regarding the biotic factors. We are able to provide the food in the quantity and quality that the species requires. We are able to eradicate predators. We are able to manipulate uh, or avoid the competition by decreasing density or by providing more food. And we are even uh, able to the, the, the reduce the occurrence of diseases by a good sanitary measurement preventing the occurrence of diseases. It is important to know that the species, uh, the requirements of the biotic and biotic uh, factors are species dependent and vary with the stage of development, age and the sex. I highlighted the dissolved oxygen and the temperature in the abiotic uh, parameters since these uh, factors are um, strongly involved in fish uh, metabolism. Temperature is a, a biotic factor that mostly affects fish metabolism. Fish are poikilothermic, that means that the body temperature is identical to the temperature of the medium. Therefore, all the stellar mach machinery will work at the temperature of the medium. So, for temperate species, normally the temperature of the medium influences the metabolism. Low temperatures, low metabolism. Higher temperatures, higher metabolism. However, the, the fish species or have a, a, an optimal interval of temperatures where they display the maximum growth. Below the, 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 a certain uh, temperature, the fish metabolism is very low. Uh, the fish almost do not eat and the both the metabolism is so high, but also the cellular metabolism is so high that there are some uh, costs related with this uh, maintaining this machinery, the cell machinery. That will affect fish growth. So it's important to define an interval of temperatures to a, where uh, we obtain the maximum growth for the species, although they are tolerant to a, a wider range of, uh, of temperatures that we also uh, are important to identify. It's important to remember that at higher temperatures, the oxygen availability is low, which affects also the metabolism, and that can occur a higher incidence of diseases. 
Regarding the oxygen, it is important to know that solubility in water is limited. In fact, the solubility of oxygen in water is much lower than the oxygen in the air. Another aspect that is important to consider is that the solubility in, of oxygen in, the, in fresh water differs from the solubility of oxygen in the, in the marine water. It tends to be higher in the same, for the same temperature. It tends to be higher in fresh water than in marine water. However, both, uh, in both conditions, the, the, the fresh water and the marine uh, uh, rearing medium, the solubility of oxygen decreases with the increasing temperature, as we can observe in both panels. Another important aspect is how to express oxygen. It's always in, important to express the both ways, as milligram per litre, which informs us about the concentration of oxygen that exists in the water, and the percentage of saturation. This measure uh, is temperature dependent and informs us about the maximum capacity of oxygen that can be dissolved in the water. As for temperature, uh, fish species or any aquatic organisms have different requirements for oxygen. For instance, salmon have high levels of oxygen uh, requirements, around uh, 6 to 8 milligrams liter, whereas African catfish can handle values, uh, lower values, that normally around 3 milligrams liter. Normally, for the temperate species that we are used to, safe values are normally above 5 milligrams per liter, but of course, always temperature dependent. So, important to retain, oxygen requirements are strongly affected by the age and stage of development, the feeding status, natatory activity and health status. On this slide, I'm presenting the life cycle of a marine fish species, in this case, Migra. We can observe that we have the egg stage, the yolk larval stage, post-flexion larvae and juvenile that will follow the ongrowing until uh, reach the marketable size. This slide is just to highlight that uh, each stage of development has specific requirements regarding abiotic and biotic uh, factors, which are important to comply in order to ob obtain uh, good survival rates and healthy and um, fast growth individuals. On this course, we will mainly talk and focus on the juvenile uh, young adult stage. In the previous slide, we already mentioned that fish has a high diversity in, 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 in terms of shape. Here, uh, I present the, the three common reared species in aquaculture, uh, which is the Sparozarata, and the common name is the Giltidat Sibrim, and the Centratrobrax, which is the sea bass, which are known as round fish regarding its body shape. Whereas the Scoftalmus maximus, uh, common name is turbot, is normally known as flat fish. This body shape provides already some information regarding the ability of this species to swim and how they allocate uh, their energy regarding the movement and natatory capacity. Despite uh, this difference in, in, in body shape, there are some recognizable anatomical uh, um, structures as the fins. The fins have the same name, although they are slightly different modified in the, in the flat fish. We can see that the three uh, um, examples that I'm providing here have the pectoral fins, which are located pectoral fins here and here in the fish, in the turbot, in the flat fish, and the pelvic ones, which are here below the pelvic and near the mouth in the case of the turbot. And then we have the caudal fin, the anal fin, which is bigger in the flat fish, and the dorsal fin that it's also uh, adapted to the body shape of the turbot. Despite the different uh, body shape and the specialization of uh, certain uh, uh, structures in some fish species, the gross anatomy is normally very similar among uh, uh, fish species and provides you an information about organization and the location of certain organs to understand some, some of the, 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 the functions that we will discuss in the, in the, in the next slides. 
Gills are the structure that allows the adaptation of fish to aquatic life. Gills are normally located in the branchial chamber and are protected by opercula. Gills consist of bony arches, to which one row of pair gills filaments are anchored. These are folded in thin epithelium to increase surface area for the gas exchange. Here in these uh, side panels, it's possible to observe the, the, the structure and the disposition of these tissues. We have the gill filament, also known as primary lamella, and then you have uh, projections uh, to this primary lamella that are known as secondary lamella. Near the lamella, they are highly irrigated with a special capillary network that allows an efficient gas diffusion and the water passing uh, makes this structure and this organization uh, an important for the efficient uh, gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, the water flow is unidirectional, so it enters in the mouth and is obliged to live through the gills, forcing the passage of the water through the, 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 the lamellas. In this uh, um, panel here, we can observe some histological sections of the, of the gills lamella. So the gills are by preference the respiration uh, organ of the, 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 the fish. Um, the, 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 the factors that uh, are needed for an efficient uh, gas exchange are the close contact with the medium, the shortest the diffusion distance, a well-developed circulatory system, which we can observe and that is a range for the fish. Um, the gills change are also involved in is more um, Sorry, the gills are also involved in the osmoregulation and the nitrogen excretion. When in the lower uh, oxygen conditions, fish are obliged to increase the opercular movements in order to increase the oxygen rates, um, in order they are able to provide the same amount of oxygen to the, the tissues, although in the rearing medium the, the, the oxygen is lower. And this implies uh, high energetic costs to compensate this alteration on the reading, medi me reading medium. On this slide, we'll continue with the circulatory system following the gills where we have the gas exchange. Here just represented the, the major uh, veins, vessels and arteries that we can observe in fish and the disposition. Uh, the, 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 the circulatory system of fish is closed, they have a two-chambered heart, and the principal functions of the, the circulatory system is to transport, is the transport. Uh, for the tissues of uh, nutrients from the digestion and oxygen that was obtained at the uh, gills levels, part of the fish in the case of the larvae, and the transport of the catabolic products that are transported to the gills and to the excretory organs. In, in conditions, of course, the, this, uh, this, uh, um, the circulation and the gas exchanges and the catabolism of the, 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 the product or the, the nutrients um, are increased when the conditions of the environment are uh, um, not adequate for the fish. So imagine, in terms of a low uh, dissolved oxygen conditions, the um, fish strategy, it will be to increase the oper opercular movement, to increase the, the, the change of the gases, to obtain more oxygen, and then they will in increase also the circulation of the blood in order to transport the oxygen or to maintain at least the same oxygen to the tissues in order that the, the fish uh, welfare is not affected. And this, this adaptation has uh, uh, energetic costs that normally can compromise growth and also the immune uh, defense of the fish. In fish, kidneys are located dorsally above the peritoneal membrane and ventrally to the vertebral column. Kidney is composed of two parts, uh, a part which is known as head kidney and represents around 20% of the total kidney and has uh, uh, roles on the immunitary immun system of the fish. And the remaining uh, kidney, which represents around 80%, known as trunk kidney, which is the um, excretory organ of the fish. 
and it is in this trunk kidney where the excretory structures are found, uh, named normally designed by nephrons. The nephrons can be glomerular and agglomerular. There are some uh, differences uh, between uh, morphologically between fresh and, uh, and, and marine uh, water. These are important structures to the excretion of the nitrogen compounds as uh, ammonia. Gills, digestive tract and skin are also involved in excretion. Osmoregulation is another important process uh, for the adaptation of the fish to the aquatic environment. We have different situations between the marine and the fresh water. Analyzing the body fluids concentrations, we can observe that they are quite similar, uh, the body fluids of the organism. However, the concentration, the osmolality and the concentration of some of the uh, mineral the, that we are talking are quite high compared to the body fluids in the marine environment, whereas they are quite low in the uh, freshwater environment. Therefore, fish, uh, freshwater fish live in an hypotonic environment and fish of the uh, marine fish live in an hypertonic environment. So they have to uh, develop strategies to maintain their homeostasis. And the, these strategies are the following that you can observe in the, in the lower panel. The fish from the marine environment, they drink and, uh, water and absorb also salt ions through the mouth and with the food. They, they excrete a very concentrated urine in order to uh, spare water. They excrete uh, ions uh, through the gills and they have some losses of water through the gills and body surface. On the other hand, the freshwater fish avoid drinking water. They just in, uh, ingest water and salt ions through the food. They will have uptake of ions through the gills they use the gills also to absorb uh, water uh, and also the, skin, uh, the skins by the body surface and they excrete highly diluted urine to compensate. All these movements, uh, all these strategies and these activities are, uh, involves active transport which implies high energetic costs for the fish. The digestive system is an important organ for the survival of the fish since it's through the digestion that fish are able to absorb the nutrients provided by the food for to sustain their growth. Mm, the digestive tract can be roughly divided in these different portions. Bucopharynx, esophagus, that we are not able to see in these uh, pictures, stomach, pyloric theca, anterior intestine and posterior intestine. And there's also important organs associated or glands associated to the digestive tract, which are liver, pancreas and gallbladder. In this image, we can see the abdominal cavity of the nigra. And here in this, in this uh, panel, we can observe the liver, the morphology of the liver, the gallbladder. Here we can see the pyloric sac, the stomach, very defined, a short anterior intestine, a very short uh, posterior intestine. This is a species with a very efficient digestion. Fish digestive tract morphology can provide us hints on fish feeding habits. Here in this panel, we have the different tract morphology for carnivorous, omnivorous, omnivorous, more uh, herbivorous and planktivorous species. Carnivorous have normally a large stomach, pyloric seca and short intestines when compared to herbivorous species that exhibit a long intestine. Normally, stomach digestion is not so effective. Therefore, the long intestine results in a longer period of food transit, which allows fish to continue the digestion and the absorptive functions to increase the efficiency of the digestion. In this slide, just an example of the, uh, the digestive tract morphologies uh, of species with different feeding habits. In this case, the guilty dead cibrim, which is a carnivorous omnivorous species, the migra, which is a carnivorous uh, species or a strictly carnivorous as normally we identify them or classify them, and the mullet, which, has a, which is an omnivorous 
uh, herbivorous uh, feeding type uh, fish. You can observe the different organs and these provide us in about the feeding strategies that these fishes has to obtain the nutrients the more efficient they can from the food they are eating. In the case of the guilty dead sea bream and the, the, the nigra, they have uh, some um, a strong uh, uh, stomach digestion uh, with the pyloric seca to uh, uh, improve the efficiency of the digestion, much more evident in the case of the nigra. And in the case of the mullet, we can observe this long intestine where the food uh, remains more time in order that the nutrients are completely or absorbed. Uh, until the, 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 the feeding transit of the, 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 the food in the, in, the digestive, in the intestine. In aquaculture, growth reflects the quality of the rearing. Growth in fish is normally characterized as allometric. This means that growth function contains an initial exponential phase, followed by a relatively linear phase that leads to a dampened phase as fish weight reaches an asymptotic maximum. Faster development and growth rates at early stages are normally associated with higher survival chances. When rearing fish or another animal, the aim is also to maximize production in a shorter period of time. This involves providing the adequate environment conditions, handling with care, prevent diseases, but more important, to supply an adequate diet to support those development and growth rates. Food provides nutrients and energy to support the metabolism of the organism. Metabolism consists in the integration of an entire set of chemical reactions that allow the organism to reproduce, to develop, to growth and maintain its structures and at the same time respond to the environment alterations that might appear. Therefore, nutrition and feeding are crucial aspects in the animal production. We consider differently nutrition and feeding. By nutrition, we normally refer to a process of providing or obtaining the adequate supply of nutrients necessary for growth. Uh, and these nutrients are normally the, 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 the protein, the, 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 the fatty acids, the lipids, and uh, the quality of these nutrients, which are the fatty acids, the type of amino acids that are evolving because we need essential amino acids. And by feeding, we consider the process of being fed or eating. And that uh, the examples are how to feed in different meals or continuously, the quantity that we must uh, uh, provide and when, morning, night. So all these aspects are need to be considered for an efficient use of the diet that is being provided. Both nutrition and feeding are affected by several factors that are uh, represented in this uh, uh, um, di diagram, diagram here. So normally the fish uh, nutritional requirements are affected by the quality of the food, by the age, the size, the temperature, the health conditions, um, the rearing conditions all contribute to influence the, the, the nutritional requirements and how the food will be used. Therefore, to sum up, this knowledge is necessary for the formulation of a balanced aquafit, which will be efficiently digested by the organism. All this information contributes. Feeds are normally composed of different nutrients. Proteins, lipids and carbohydrates are the main constituents of the fish diets. They are also known as macronutrients since normally they are present in grams in the, in the, in the feed formulation. Um, vitamins and minerals are the, the other nutrients present in the diet and are known as micronutrients because normally they are present in milligrams or even lower quantities and then they are known as oligoelements. In this table, uh, it is presented some of the functions that uh, these nutrients are involved in the organism. Feed formulation uses several ingredients with different origin, and they need to be blended and processed uh, to uh, provide a specific composition in order to uh, comply with the species nutritional requirements. In this uh, slide, I'm presenting here the example of the gross nutritional composition for the guilty dead cibrim. Uh, we can observe that the crude protein is the, the higher component of the diet, 
followed by the crude fat. Uh, Seabrim is able to use uh, partially the starch that in this uh, uh, feed is also used for the purpose of the extrusion in terms of the feed technology. To understand which are the fish species requirements for a certain uh, nutrient, what normally is done is trying to define which is the optimum level of that nutrient in the feed. Uh, and for that, it is necessary to perform uh, nutritional trials, formulating uh, aquafeeds with uh, that nutrient at different percentages. Uh, in the end, um, um, we, it is important to assess several zootechnical parameters in order to evaluate how the diet uh, uh, responds and how the fish respond to the diet. And normally, the zootechnical parameters that are used are growth, specific rate, height, uh, food conversion, and protein retention, for instance. In this uh, plot here, you can uh, observe how the, the, the methods to identify the optimum level of the nutrient in the aquafit. And that uh, um, method was known as broken line. And it informed us that after a certain uh, uh, amount of uh, nutrient in the diet, the growth is not improved. Therefore, no need to be providing uh, more uh, nutrient. Uh, in the diet because fish will not, grow more, no, will not grow more. And this is quite important in terms of uh, sparing protein because protein is the most expensive nutrient in a diet. So you can, uh, nowadays there are softwares that are used to determine, determine the optimum level and to identify it. Uh, another important information is that normally uh, the percentage of the nutrient will decrease with the fish growth. When developing aquafits for fish, it is also important to assure that essential nutrients are present. And by essential nutrient, it means it must be provided by the diet since the organism is not able to synthesize it. For instance, in the case of the protein synthesis, there are 20 amino acids that are involved in the protein synthesis. And part of them are essential amino acids. That means that must be provided by the food. And just a well and balanced uh, mixture of these amino acids allow an effective and uh, uh, efficient protein synthesis. In the case of fatty acids, they are much more dynamic and sometimes more difficult to define the requirements. Uh, but it is important to know that uh, the alpha linolenic and uh, linolenic acids, fatty acids, are essential for the fresh water. Um, species and bowl and for also for the marine species. But if these uh, fatty acids the, from uh, chain length 18 are present in the diet, freshwater species are able to elongate them to the EPA, DHA and arachidonic acid or ARA, marine species are not able to do it. So it, it means that EPA, DHA and ARA also need to be included in the marine fish species aquafits, uh, besides um, alpha linolenic and linolenic acids. A balanced diet results in a higher nutrient absorption that is known, and this a higher absorption of the nutrient will result in a lower FCR, that means a good food conversion ratio, and uh, will uh, result also in a lower nitrogen excretion, which is very important in terms of environment. With this slide, I just want to highlight that after digestion and being absorbed at the intestinal level, all the nutrients can be used uh, to obtain energy. And uh, which normally, when trying to formulate a diet, we aim that the proteins that are absorbed or amino acids are used for protein synthesis, trying to reduce the amount of amino acids that are used for energy because protein is a very expensive uh, um, nutrient and therefore we want that the protein that is in the food being used for protein synthesis. If the diet is bad, not properly balanced, the amino acids will be used uh, for energy, so they will be catabolized and there will be a higher excretion of nitrogen. And this is important in terms of environmental, when we need to provide balanced diets in order to decrease the nitrogen um, 
release by the, um, the excretion level. Digestive tract is the bioreactor where the digestive process occurs to obtain and break down the food in smaller uh, molecules that can be attacked uh, mechanically or through the um, uh, enzymes. Uh, the process of the capture involves uh, several sensorial um, organs and then at the digestive tract there are mechanical and chemical uh, forces working upon the, the, the food items that were ing ingested. Just to a small note to mention that normally the stomach has an acidic pH which uh, um, allows to uh, or eases the breakdown of the chemical uh, um, connections between the molecules and that, that the pH is normally uh, neutralized when entering the intestine by the secretions of the pancreas, bicarbonate, uh, to neutralize the pH in order that the um, intestinal enzymes are able to work efficiently. And these are some of the classes that uh, are identified in fish's digestive intestines. Another important aspect that we need to analyze is to uh, assess the digestibility of the diet. And that is done normally, indirectly, by analyzing the feces or the nutrients present in the feces. If there's a lot of nutrients in the feces, it indicates that the digestibility is very poor and that the uh, nutrients, uh, nitrogen included, will be released to the environment and having some problems uh, in terms of the quality of environmental and uh, atrophication. Therefore, that's why it is important to analyze uh, and to have a quite balanced diet in order to increase the digestibility of that nutrients. If the nutrients are absorbed, they will be used for the metabolic purposes. And so we talk about the metabolism level after the absorption. It is important to know, of course, that uh, the digestive process is, depends also on the several aspects as the species, the, the uh, rearing conditions, the temperature, the amount and quality of the, the, the food uh, or the feed provided. Of course, that a bad feed we will have problems in terms of digestibility. Factors that will affect the absorption efficiency, the ingestion rate, the gut capacity, and the residence time of the digester in the gut. Fish performance has to be easily and rapidly assessed. And the most common parameters that are measured and analyzed are survival, growth, and uh, how the full feed is used. By survival, you have to register the number of dead fish during an experimental try or during your rearing. The growth, you can calculate uh, simply by calculating the difference uh, between the weight at the beginning of the trial and at the final of the time to obtain the gain uh, of that uh, trial or the, the, the production that you are having and the calculate the specific growth rate which allow you to, to compare with other condition, experimental conditions with, when you have different time periods and also the daily growth index which normally is used uh, for uh, fish that uh, pass the exponential uh, growth uh, phase of the curve and reaches the asymptotic uh, um, curve. So this is some of the parameters used for uh, excess growth. Regarding the feed utilization, you can use the food conversion ratio, the feed efficiency. They are uh, they 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 provide the same information but uh, are calculating in a in inverse in a different way, in a verse pattern. We can also obtain uh, um, an information about the protein ratio uh, efficiency ratio by uh, calculating. Uh, the wet gain, wet weight gain uh, obtained, and uh, over the, the crude protein that was uh, uh, provided to the, the to the fish. This is our this uh, uh, zootechnical parameters are simple and rapid to use by the fish farmer. However, if we want to in depth uh, how fish is responding to the, the experimental condition, we can also use a multi array of analytical, analytical tools to complement this information, such as biochemical, enzymological, histological, and molecular tools. 
In previous slides, we were uh, analyzing and understanding the functioning of uh, different uh, biological structures of the fish in order to understand how we can minimize uh, energetic costs during the rearing conditions. We know that food uh, is the provider of the nutrients and of the energy, but we know that uh, uh, along the, the food process, there, are, will be, there will be some energy dissipation that it's important to minimize in order to obtain more energy to somatic investment. Somatic investment, it means growth. And in this model for the sea bream, you have the principal uh, points where energy is uh, uh, dissipated and um, we can improve by providing fish with adequate nutrition uh, and uh, that can be better assimilated, better digested and uh, uh, uses less energy to catabolize. Indirectly, we can use the uh, several measurements of oxygen, di carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen to evaluate how the fish is processing the, 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 the food. The oxygen uh, will uh, work as a proxy uh, regarding the metabolic activity and energy production for the different functions. The carbon dioxide release is a proxy for the cellular catabolism and indicates how much of the, 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 the nutrients are being break down to obtain energy. And the uh, um, nitrogen excretion can provide us an important information about the breakdown of protein that is being used for energy. Following the energetic budget for the fish and for the different uh, energetic uh, requirements, it's important to know that the energy available for the different biological processes is highly linked to the dissolved oxygen in the water. With this graph, it helps to understand why. The fish consumption uh, can be maximum at maximum uh, concentrations of dissolved oxygen in the water. And at this condition, in these conditions, the metabolic um, rate can be maximum. And fish has a, 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 a large amount of aerobic, uh, of oxygen to use in the growth, digestion, excretion, reproduction and immune defenses after supplying these requirements for the basal uh, metabolic needs. If the dissolved oxygen decreases, this aerobic scope also decreases and uh, the oxygen consumption is lower, resulting that the energy that fish has to allocate for the different biological process is also lower. It can even be critical if the oxygen in the water only allows to maintain the, the minimum basal requirements and above, below these values they will result in death of the fish. So this is quite important to understand the amount of energy that, uh, that fish has to allocate to the different biological process is highly dependent on the dissolved oxygen and water. And therefore the stress that normally we have to provide fish with good oxygen conditions. Respecting the fish welfare and promote the health management are crucial in a, in a, in a fish farm. This will allow fish uh, to use the energy for growth and to have energy to respond um, easily to the new changes on the medium. The five freedoms that are normally uh, named regarding the fish welfare are to provide the fish an adequate environment, food availability uh, to cope with the fish requirements in terms of quantity and quality, to promote good practices to maintain sanitary conditions and promote health of the fish, to provide um, an, an environment without distracts and fear factors, and also to allow the fish to have a normal display a normal behavior. All these factors contribute to good welfare conditions and to provide fish with enough energy to growth and to respond to changes in the medium. Fish perceive alterations to its homeostasis and as mechanisms to respond um, like behavior, cellular, physiologic and metabolic mechanisms. And through this, 
a fish will regain homeostasis and will adapt to the new conditions. But these uh, adaptations involve energy and these energetic costs might compromise the fish performance, they resulting in a lower fitness and higher susceptibility to disease. The implementation of good practices in a, in a fish farm, it's always important to promote welfare and prevent diseases. There are some parameters that can be easily used to forecast any problem that uh, will occur. For instance, ranges of the dissolved oxygen, the temperature, ammonia, other nitrogen compounds, salinity, the presence of pathogens are always indicated that something might be wrong and we can uh, uh, implement measures to correct the situations. So we can predict by having a, a, a proper register of these parameters. There are also other parameters that can be used and identify that the problem is already there. And there uh, are among them the depressed growth, changes on behavior, lesion, lesions on the skin of the fish, the more aggressive behavior, among others. And these parameters can be easily, um, can be easily used by the farmers. Of course, to, to, to identify and try to solve the situations uh, in a proper way, we can uh, use specialized analysis that will provide a better assessment of the fish condition and how we can uh, implement corrective measures. Within the project, uh, assess to see, a lump fish welfare watcher were developed. Three tools are available in this, uh, in this platform. Uh, E-learning course, uh, where in this short online course you can obtain essential information for both professionals and students on uh, lump fish welfare. It also shows how to score the lump fish visual indicators, which is essential to use the rapid welfare assessment tool. In the body mass uh, in this calculator, this tool provides the calculation of the BME of a given sample of lungfish based on wet weight and total length. This tool calculates the proportion of fish that are emaciated, underweight, normal weight or above normal weight and estimates the body weight, the fitness ratio and the maximum mesh size that is required to prevent lungfish from escaping. This calculator also provides summary statistics and recommendations for action based on the BME outcome for the sample population. And the third tool, the Rapid Welfare Assessment Tool, that with the purpose is to calculate the Lambfish Operational Welfare Score. The index based on the, uh, on the body mass index as for additional welfare metrics, body damage, tail or caudal fin damage score, high condition score and sucker deformity score. With this chart for the lump fish welfare diagnosis, um, it's easy to identify the condition of the fish regarding its welfare, if it's a good welfare, moderately compromised welfare and severely compromised welfare. This rapid welfare analytic tool allows to identify and to implement corrective measures as fast as possible. We already mentioned uh, some uh, uh, aspects of the feeding and the purpose of the feed management is trying to uh, minimize the feed loss to an environment uh, and, uh, and uh, assure that the fish are efficiently using the feeds that we are providing. Therefore, it's important to know when is fish using the food or ingesting the food properly. And then it's important to know how to provide it. Do you provide it continu continuously or we will have different uh, meals along the day? And how about the quantity? We want to provide the certain amount of quantity that will allow fish to grow and not uh, wasting feeds to the medium. And when there are some species that eat better in the morning and others that uh, eat better in the, in the dusk. So these aspects are all always important to know in order to optimize the way the diet eats uh, 
provided to the fish in order to increase the feeding efficiency of the, the species. Regarding the types of feeding, we can do it manually or using automatic feeders. When using uh, manually, we can control better the amount of feed provided, especially when we are using ad libitum. Ad libitum, it means that we will provide feeds until we visibly observe that animal is satiated. Of course, in the manual feeding, we can also use uh, to provide the amount uh, using the feeding tables that are provided by the feeds uh, enterprises. With the automatic feeders, we can use it um, following the, the, the feeding charts and we provide the feed continuously. And we can, uh, of, of course, define the time of the, me the meals that we are providing or um, uh, the amount that we are providing in each meal. It is important also to observe that the, the, the pipes that are connected to the automatic feeder are clean and are not stuck with the grease that sometimes remains. Type of feeds for nutritional experiment can be named as control feed, a reference feed and test feed. Control feed is normally a commercial, commercially available feed formulation for the target species at the stage of culture at which the study is carrying out. The reference feed, it will be a control feed where a reference product is included in its formulation and then we can compare the, 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 the performance uh, regarding the control feed and the test feed where uh, a, a control uh, feed is uh, used, including a test product that we want to assess uh, uh, for the, the preparing the formulation. How to prepare and calculate the feed that we need for our, uh, our tanks and experiments that we are taking care? Uh, as, you, as we mentioned before, we can feed ad libidum. In this case, we will provide feed uh, until the fish are satiated. If you are doing it manually, we can observe the moment that the fish is not interested in the food anymore, and then we will register the amount of feed that was used by that tank. Um, if we are using automatic feeders, uh, the excess of feed that was deliverable and that the fish is not eating anymore, we will register. If we are feeding according to the feeding tables, we have to calculate the daily feed ration that we need per tank per day, and that uh, we have to include some information on this calculus. We need to know the species that we are feeding, the size of the, 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 the fish, the expected specific row rate, and the temperature of the culture. And then we obtain the value that we need to uh, use to feed the, the species. In the framework of the Access to Sea project, a uh, feed intake regulation tool was develop, developed for the waste management in fish production. This tool is the result of an experimental work carried out planning and executing three fish trials aimed to gather experimental data to ultimately support the de development, fitting and validation of a numeric model foreseeing an optimization of fish intake according to fish weight, water temperature and salinity. The results of all trials produced a final data set subjected to data analysis methodologies, which was finally used to produce the tool. And you can check on the demonstration here on this line. Fish production systems are normally uh, located offshore, as the case of the cages. They can be land bases, as the case of uh, recirculated uh, aquaculture systems or flow through uh, systems, and in stewarding areas, normally in earthen ponds. Examples of integrated production systems are EMTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, and Aquaponics. Uh, EMTA can be located offshore, can be land based, or in earthen ponds whereas aquaponics are normally land-based. Thank you for your attention. I hope it was clear. If you need any further clarification, please do not hesitate and you can contact me by email. Thank you very much.